Continuing our path on the intended learning outcomes, we are now joined by a very important figure, Benjamin Samuel Bloom, a psychologist and pedagogist born in the United States in 1913, that you might know as the author of the so-called Bloom's Pyramid. Bloom's Pyramid is a taxonomy of learning objectives that Benjamin Bloom and his collaborators built on the basis of empirical studies carried out in the United States in the mid-50s. An important note, we have just heard for the first time about learning objectives, while so far we have talked about intended learning outcomes. These are two different perspectives on the same topic. According to Bloom, learning objectives explain what for the teacher is really important to achieve. Biggs, on the other hand, the person who inspired us until now, believes that intended learning outcomes are the fundamental tools to support us, however possible, to design activities and the most appropriate learning context for our students. Even if Bloom puts more focus on the teacher's objectives, his taxonomy can be extremely useful in designing our intended learning outcomes. One interesting thing is that originally there were more than one Bloom's taxonomies. In the mid-50s, he analyzed a series of learning domains in relation to which he drew up three taxonomies, one related to the cognitive learning objectives, one related to the affective learning domain, and one to the psychomotor learning domain. Our educational systems, however, place a heavy weight on the cognitive learning objectives. And this has made it so that since the 50s to this day, only the taxonomy related to cognitive learning objectives has been repeatedly analyzed and spread. This very articulated flower is the first representation of Bloom's taxonomy, created in 1956. As you can see, it doesn't really look like a pyramid. Inside, we can find the different learning objectives typologies, then the actions that substantiate the performance related to the learning objectives, and finally, in the more external area, the products that can be the results of such performance. Despite it being an elaboration from the 50s, the type of works suggested are very broad. They range from a traditional written output to a presentation, to the creation of a radio program, a cartoon, and so on. The types of learning you see are not represented in some kind of hierarchy, but are presented instead according to a circular movement. Lots of reworkings have been made on this articulated flower, and they mainly focus on the central part of it, the one that describes the different kinds of learning objectives. That's how the famous Bloom's Pyramid has been created. As you can see, it has at its basis the first level of learning objectives related to knowledge. On top of that, the next level is the one connected to comprehension, then the one connected to application, the level of application is the one where we can start developing the learning objectives connected to the analysis, synthesis, and finally the higher level of evaluation. But the Bloom's Pyramid was not a static tool for too long. 
In 2001, in fact, a revised version developed by Kratovol and Henderson was published, and it introduced some very important conceptual differences. Now try to compare the two pyramids and see where the differences are. I'll give you a few seconds to think about this. Okay, have you found uh, any differences? I guess you have. Let's try to find them together. In the original version of the pyramid, the different types of learning were described with nouns. In the new one, on the other hand, we find verbs. It is a significant difference because the use of the verb as we said when we talked about how to correctly formulate an intended learning outcome, pushes us into the perspective of the student's performance. We expect the student to be able to analyze, to be able to apply, and so on. This is the first main difference, verbs, students' actions. The second difference is that knowledge is substituted by remembering, not knowing. I guess you'd notice them. This is a very peculiar thing because in Kratvold and Anderson's version, knowledge has a too broad a meaning in terms of performance and potentially could encompass all types of learning. Consequently, they translated it in terms of remembering. There is another important difference between the two pyramids. Let's have a look. You can see that at the top of the two pyramids, there are two slightly different things. In the previous one, there is assessment. In this one, there is creating. Kratvold and Anderson worked on this new pyramid at the beginning of the 2000s. For this reason, in their perception, the topic of the learning objectives connected to creative abilities becomes important in a completely different way compared to what happened in Bloom's work. So we have a new pyramid that can become for us an extremely interesting reference in the design of these intended learning outcomes. Let's now try to sum up. The key message is that Bloom's taxonomy, the one reviewed by Kratzvold and Anderson in 2001, helps us in designing intended learning outcomes that can cover different dimensions, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. These dimensions can help us to build a wider ecosystem of abilities for the students of the new millennium.